So I'm uh, actually VP of product management. I do lead uh, developer relations across the company, which is uh, an absolute pleasure. It's about 500 people across Google. Um, and then I lead product management for developer platforms, uh, which is about 50 people across Firebase, systems like Stackdriver, which is an, uh, an, a DevOps infrastructure, plus our container systems, our container builders, and everything that we do to make software great at Google uh, internally. I'd like to take about 20 minutes of your time to talk you through how I think about developer ecosystems in an age of platforms, and I hope you'll find it useful. As we know, this is the best time in all of history to be a developer, right? Spectacular time. We have an incredible range of platforms, right? Many of the platforms that I'm showing here uh, actually weren't invented just a couple of years ago. And if you're targeting your business for the next three to five years, as the gentleman in the back wisely said, you have to anticipate that the platforms that are gonna be using your software haven't yet been invented because the cost of innovation is so low in hardware as well as software. As a result, we've also created all of this open source as tools that we can use to build our own systems and we can modify it. You don't like how Ruby handles this particular thing? Write your own gem. Uh, so this idea that open source is open and free is irrelevant. What's relevant is that this represents the industrialization phase of software. We're moving out of the craftsman phase where everybody had their own hand cobbled tools and their own ways of doing things. Now we have standardized on open source. So if you don't understand this well, just search and replace in your head developer for carpenter, right? And open source for two by four. Think about what happened to the construction industry when you started to standardize materials. So open source is a large scale movement to standardization of materials. No matter what business you're in, you should pay attention to this. So Rio, anybody here heard of Rio Tinto? Okay, good, so, so people know where gold comes from. That's excellent. Uh, so Rio Tinto says the future miners will be software developers. They're not talking about Bitcoin. <laughs> okay, they're actually talking about the economics of mining change when you don't have to put humans in mines, right? You don't have to worry about safety. You don't have to worry about ventilation. So who becomes the most critical employee in the production process? It's the developer who's programming the mining robots. So I told you it's the best time ever to be a software developer. It's only going to get better, right? Um, AI is transforming drug creation. We no longer have to do messy field-driven drug discovery. We can do virtual d drug discovery using a simulation powered by hundreds of thousands of cores and go and find through machine learning what molecules might actually give us a solution to the op opioid crisis? What might, us, what might let us relieve pain without triggering addiction? That's actually been discovered. It's in early development now. It happened this year through the power of large-scale computation. It was done by developers. So think about that. The panel earlier said developer demand is high. It's really important for all of you to consider this. There are about 21.5 million developers in the world active today. When we cut that by who's writing code most of the time, you get down to about 11 and a half million developers worldwide. So 50% or more of your time spent writing code with what we call a professional developer. Doesn't mean the other 10 million aren't employed to do software. We're just talking about how much of your time is spent on it. Now that is a whole bunch of people that are not demanding your software. In fact, they don't care. You are demanding their time and their attention. They are the supply, you're the demand, you're competing for them. It's an important inversion of perspective to take as you try to think about how do you expand your platform. I wanna locate us in time. Uh, this is Carlotta Perez, I think uh, one of the greatest living economists. She is the student of Schumpeter. Everybody's heard of creative destruction, right? And Schumpeter in turn was a student of Kondratiev. Kondratiev asked himself, uh, he was an economist from Russia in the early 1900s, asked himself, why does global economy seem to expand and contract in these strange 45 to 60 year cycles going back to when modern economics really started being practiced in the 1700s? That discipline started looking at the technology impact. So this is why now our, our, our latest um, um, archetype of this research calls her book Technological Revolutions in Financial Capital. It turns out these markets march from the invention of automation to large scale deployment, and they're accompanied by these cycles of capital. Just give you a very quick overview. This is much like the technology adoption life cycle. 
and I uh, will provide the slides with, uh, for you afterwards so you can, you can go back and reference the teachers that we're learning from. So you have an early industry that starts to explode with potential. Very few people understand it, and a few people invest in it and become very rich. Seeing that wealth creation, you have this irrational exuberance. I think everybody here is old enough to remember that phrase. When this expectation of wealth crosses over to the mainstream without the understanding of what the technology is that you're investing in. There's actually overdevelopment, which leads to a collapse. It's not a smooth curve, much like crossing the chasm. You end up having a bubble. Has anybody heard of the canal bubble? It happened in England in the late 1700s because the enthusiasm was now that the British Empire is so powerful bringing resources in to the middle of England and we've got automation so that you can have looms and mills turning all this cotton into, into uh, 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 cloth and finished goods, how will we get all this product to market? Oh my God, we need canals. Because they didn't have railroads, right? How are they going to move it all around? So the canals were the internet right, of the manufactured age with the first industrial revolution. So this cycle, it turns out, happens again and again want to locate us where we are now, we're just entering the golden age. So we are post the first collapse, right, with the, with the, the dot-com bust, and those bubbles always are followed by another, another bubble in a non-related industry because the overheated market spits out their funds and the funds go somewhere else. So they went into real estate, so we had a real estate crash. But these are very consistent, and she studied these over time. I'm not going to walk through these in in detail, but she lays out sort of these five phases of these long cycles of innovation and how they've happened. The important thing to take away from this is there's nothing new about what's happening. What One of the side effects of this bubble is that you invest globally so heavily in the technology that it becomes free. So what's free? All of your Wi-Fi is free, right? Your CPU is basically free. Your storage is, is basically free. This is what people don't understand and haven't adapted to. So I encourage you as leading thinkers in your companies trying to figure out how to transform your operations toward a platform, how to explain it and why you have to grapple with it. Now you could ask, why is it so hard? It's hard because most people don't understand developers, they don't understand code, and they don't understand how developers and code combine to take actions. This is Grace Hopper. She programmed on a mainframe. Anybody here have mainframe experience? Awesome, I salute you. Uh, my dad was a mainframe programmer. He's actually a chemical engineer for Shell. He never would have said that he was a programmer. That wasn't a job. There was a job called chemical engineer. Some of us coded in Fortran. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. My, da my, dad's, uh, my dad's master's thesis was uh, 18,000 cards. And now we're back to functional programming. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm 46, so you know, I'm kind of uh, on the high end of the curve at Google. Um, I, I'm often the oldest person in the room, which feels weird to me now, but uh, I'm, get, I'm starting to get used to it. Except when I'm in the room with a nut, and then I feel like a very young man indeed. <laughs> so you probably recognize these two folks, uh, right? Here's, here's Bill Gates and Paul Allen. Uh, strangely enough, I ended up working for the guy in the middle, um, but that was the first computer I used, the Commodore PET, uh, eight kilobytes. But now, instead of individual developer heroes, we have books that say developers are the new kingmakers. How they conquered the world, right? That would have been a big stretch for me when I graduated. I had a degree in artificial intelligence and neuroscience. And if you talked about AI in 94, which is the second AI winter, you'd go to the back of the line. The developer's in charge of nothing. You're in charge of getting paid if you could. Now we're game makers. Now why is that? So going back to the, the idea that all this stuff is free and that people are very slow to adapt their thinking, think about back of the chessboard types of problems. A couple of um, a couple of good examples that may help you communicate, because I suspect that you already find all this stuff familiar. So part of my purpose here is to offer you some, um, some terms and examples that are worn smooth that you can use with your management team. A pair of economists in England uh, about, a, about a year ago put together a study that uh, took a lot of effort to figure out what was the change in the cost of light. So from 1300 to 1800, 500 years, light got cheaper by a factor of three. It's three times cheaper. Per, uh, in, measured in pounds sterling per lumen in that time. Okay, so the dark ages, it turns out, really were dark, right? Light was expensive. In the next 200 years, it got cheaper by a factor of 3,300. Now, from scarcity to ubiquity in a couple hundred years. Now, given human lifespans, how we process information, the rate of change of our neurons, this kind of gave all of society a chance to catch up with these ideas that, you know, we've got light infrastructure and it's cheap and we can do new things with it. In 20 years, 
we had a 3,700x price performance improvement in silicon. No wonder people haven't caught up, right? You have to be right in it all the time to understand the power of the change. You think that's impressive. How about 19,000? The cost of storage has, run, has, has decreased by 19,000 uh, in roughly the same time frame. So as we think through this, realize that the world is changing faster and faster. The economics we used to know aren't the economics that are gonna, present, that are, that are gonna be present in the future. So how do we assume that all these things are free and how does that change our businesses? One thing it will do is put a huge amount of focus on software as the basis of how you do business. And for that, you'll need developers. One way to visualize and tell the story about light is right, here's, here's the world at night. It's changed, changed the landscape of everything we can see. If only we could do the same thing for software and physical infrastructure. OK, we can. So as of 2014, here's a map of the devices connected to the internet. Now, this is by Shodan, uh, who arguably used illegal methods to gather this information so we don't talk about that. I'd love for somebody to come up with a modern map of this. Um, <laughs> But uh, we're not in that business. But this is a pretty good, uh, pretty good system. Now, if you take what Anant has been talking about, right, and what Dr. Bhargava has been talking about, APIs rule them all. So this is not an API view. This is an end devices view. How might we have an API view? This is a great work by the Center for Global Enterprise and Georgia Tech to visualize all of the APIs on the internet. All right, the size of the, uh, of the circle is how much they're being used, and the connectivity uh, represents how much they're, uh, how much they're, uh, how much intercall there is between them. Um, you will see that the biggest bubbles also map to the wealthiest companies today. It wasn't always so, right? So when when Timothy and uh, David McLaughlin started at Google, we didn't really even have much in the way of APIs. In fact, when David McLaughlin started a decade ago, the Google Maps API had just started to creep into public awareness, right? And the beginning of mashups. Remember mashups? Yeah. Isn't it awesome to be old? Um, so that map, that, that, this map 10 years ago would have been basically black. Right? So this is changing fast. There's still opportunity to get into it and move it around. Now, Philips has taken this fairly seriously. Um, so the Hue light bulb, probably most of you have heard of it if you haven't played with it. They are not only making light cheaper, but they're making it programmable. So we think about every single light bulb that's going in, just the North American fleet will probably have an 80% uh, turnover in the next three years due to requirements on energy, uh, energy saving and energy consumption. Every new Philips light bulb that gets installed is an LED. What's an LED? It's an integrated circuit. What do they have? They're adding things like temperature sensors, uh, mesh networking. So this map is going to change because light is not just getting more ubiquitous, it's becoming programmable. Similarly, with Nike, they've created the Fuel Lab, uh, and as they say, just develop it. Right? I love Nike. Um, now, we're fortunate to have a set of academics, right? and one of the great things about the academy as a, as a practitioner is academics are patient, thoughtful, and know way more calculus than I can remember. So they do the hard work of figuring out things like fairness, right? How do you understand what an, what an economy looks like? How do you know that there's a fair distribution of value and uh, profit in an ecosystem? So Jeffrey Parker and Marshall Van Alston are people that we've worked with directly. I haven't met Xiaoyi Zhang, but I'm sure that person is excellent. I really like the statements here. And again, not, not to test all of our eyes, but I'll read, it, I'll read out a couple of things. This concept of using a formal model of code spillovers, we show how a rising number of developers can invert the firm. The paper's worth, uh, worth reading, but I'll get into this in a little bit more detail. Firms that pursue high-risk innovations with more developers can be more profitable than firms that pursue low-risk innovations with fewer developers. More developers give platform firms more chances at success. Timothy tried to point this out as he was explaining, you can't figure out the killer apps. You don't even know what your platform's for yet. Right? It's definitely wrong. Whatever you think your platform is, unless you've got tens of thousands of developers, you're definitely wrong. That's OK. We all are. We try to get it incrementally less wrong. The only way to get that signal is by outside developers who didn't write the code. Common mistake is that you mistake your internal developers as good judges of what external developers might think. Wrong. They don't get paid to deal with all of the muck and trash and your terrible schema and all the things that make it hard for them to understand what you're doing. But you do have to focus on this idea that external developers absorb risk. Right? They can take on projects that can afford to fail, unlike how you may feel about your own personal reputation or how you're deploying your capital. So what does an inversion of the firm look like based on code spillovers? In the 20th century, 
it's kind of common knowledge that you have an 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of the profits go to 20% of the companies. This is part of why. You want to be a product firm in this view. This is where your information asymmetry is maximized. You are the only person who knows what the customer is paying for and the balance of profit and cost of everything that goes into your product. Like, let's take a car. So in a car, your raw materials suppliers might be bauxite miners in Australia, or they might be aluminum refiners. Your component suppliers might give you struts. Your subsystem suppliers might give you car seats. And then finally, you assemble it to a car. Now, you decide the balance of payments throughout the whole ecosystem, and you're the only one who can take, the, take it to market. That's fine in an era of mass production, mass consumption, mass communication. But communication is fragmented. Consumption is fragmented, so this model doesn't work anymore. The leading companies have inverted the model. They stand at the bottom of a vast ecosystem. They enable that ecosystem. Now, when I left Microsoft in 2009, just to think about the numbers here, the platform business was worth $65 billion in annual revenue, fabulously profitable, about $24 billion in profit. Um, Steve uh, Bomber used to say, well, this is between 2007 and 2008, we increased our profits $2 billion. He said, we grew a Boeing last year. And in 2009, we had the same review, profits increased by four billion. He said that last year we grew two Boeings. So these are fairly good businesses. What was the value that was distributed to the developers of products, the developers who resold those products and customized those? What was the value that went to the developers who built solutions on top of it, taking it all the way to the end user? 450 billion. That's a fair distribution of profit. So as you design incentives, right, you heard that kind of in specific advice on thinking about the ecosystem uh, incentives for the individuals. Think about it in terms of the scale. You should be looking at eight to one or 10 to one market opportunity for those outside. Quick history lesson. Anybody have a BlackBerry anymore? No, they went from 52% market share to 3% market share in five years. That's hard. That's hard to do, <laughs> right? So what happened? They lost track of the incentives. They thought it would be an awesome idea to offer developers an 80-20 split where they took 80% of the value of any application purchase and gave the developers a princely, a lordly, fantastic 20%. Apple went, hmm, what if we did 70-30 the other way? <laughs> right, massive migration, right, because they followed the incentives. And multiple, you know, multiple billions of dollars have gone in uh, just to the Apple ecosystem, let alone the Android ecosystem. You look at that inversion, and you start to think fairness is absolutely crucial in building a platform. Anybody familiar with the, uh, the, uh, the, the free $10 fairness exercise they've been conducting in a few business schools, Harvard included? So they take two people, obviously a pool of people, but they take two people, they give one person $10, and that person, who says the other person they've never met, they, their job is to offer a split that the other person will accept, in which case both people get free money. So the best way to get the other person to say yes is offer them $5. But if it starts to get unfair, right, as you get to, like, I'll take seven and you get three and I'm in control, people will turn down three free dollars because they don't feel it's fair. People have very sophisticated emotional processes running here. So think about your reputation as you design it. You want to design a fair split. Why is this better than the product model? Look at the loop, right? So your platform is protected by an API. With the developers building on your platform, every single function, every single call that goes through to your platform can only go to your platform, can't be transmitted by anybody else, can't be trapped by anybody else. It's an HTTPS call. By the power of DNS, it's going to go directly to your servers. And every single thing you do will get stored as your data. It could be metadata, who, how, why, what, where, when. That's all information. Right? Every time they call your API, it's a signal from the market let alone the actual data that they're transacting. Right? They're going to give you data. They're going to take data back. So these ecosystems are technically structured, and they build up your data asset. So as we think about developers getting into that environment, right, we want to make sure that it's easy for them to have code spillovers, primarily through open source. And we want to make sure that it's easy for them to take actions. So open source as a mechanism of action is critical here. As you have one developer come into your ecosystem, you just take that, that minimum down right, to answer the gentleman's question on three to five years. First thing, find that first developer and encourage them to build an open source library. What does that do? That decreases the cognitive load for anybody else who wants to use the same thing because their lessons are embodied in the code. 
oh my God, how do I do authentication? Oh, let me simplify this, right? Let me parameterize this. Let me do this in a way that is idiomatically uh, correct for Ruby or for Spring Java, right? So that you can start to get out of these communities. Absolutely crucial. Depending on what kind of platform your business you're, look, you're looking at, it could also play the role of portable assets. So at Google, we've created first party open source with Kubernetes and TensorFlow. By creating those communities, we've created new interest in Google's cloud platform, people, uh, and, in, and in fact, in Android. Future versions of Android can run TensorFlow directly on your handset. So creating new communities that will pull our platforms, right? But again, they're open, so you can run them anywhere. Nobody wants to be locked in. Or in the third party, you might find that your developer community is using a bunch of open source already. It makes a lot of sense to go meet them where they are, make sure their libraries work really well with your stuff. So this is a broad audience. You have come from a lot of different industries. So I don't know the specifics of any one of them. But I guarantee you, if you look around, there's some open source activity that relates to something that you're trying to do. Second, I want to look at development and the move from closed development to open development. So if you're familiar with the, the pipelines to platforms, and I think Dr. Bhargava talked about this, this probably looks really familiar to most people here. Right? This is a release management process. And it probably looks a lot like a pipeline, right? There's only one way in. There's only one way out. It is, in fact, a pipeline and not a platform. This is designed to remove choice from developers inside your firm and any contractors that you have so that they reduce their error rate, error rate and they do things in a very predictive uh, fashion. This makes a ton of sense if your big risk is that they're going to waste resources. But the resources are free. This is the opposite of what you should be doing, right? You should have open development where there's an explosion of new ways to control source, new ways to do builds. There's a desire, right? Developers are busting out of this sort of frozen pipeline mentality. And if you don't get out of it, they will leave your company. You want to be able to bring in these kinds of systems that allow them to develop at high speed, take lots of risks, and have not, not, no one of those risks take your business down. So there's a longer story on this, but um, it links back to what's the relationship with development and marketing. How do you think about A-B testing? How much code are you changing at once? Google's able to ship uh, to production about uh, 8,000 times a day. So across all of our products, across all our developers, we're able to do that by shipping very small features that if they break, that they won't break search, right? That if they do break something badly, they can be rolled back within a couple of minutes. So the contract around software development, how well you can see the target and how long it takes to get there is changing. As everything is getting cheaper, you have to be able to develop very quickly. So one critical thing you have to do is embrace these kinds of continuous integration, continuous delivery platforms. So from open source, we ended up in open development. It's no shock, actually, that every single logo here represents an open source project. Developers won't really accept anything else anymore. And then finally, open community. And I'm just going to frame a little bit about what, of, of what the, the excellent panel already offered you. But Thinking about community management as a discipline is really important. Dr. Bargava and I are talking about how do, how do we start to bring community management as a discipline to the business school audience. This is something that should be taken as seriously as you might have taken product management 50, 60 years ago if you could have a vision into the future. Right? Once upon a time, you couldn't get a degree with a concentration in product management. Something changed. It became obvious. Right? Now we have legions of product managers. Community management is at this tipping point where we're starting to see the value a community manager can bring for a platform. I'm going to call out a few particular, uh, few particular roles here. Uh, one is uh, a guru maker, just to give you a taste of chocolate here. Right? These are all meaningful roles in a community. A guru maker is interesting. Anybody been to the theater in the last five, 10 years? Like actual theater? OK, so can you remember what the spotlight operator looked like? No, it's basically impossible, right? This person's wearing black. They're sitting behind a bright light. Even if you looked at it the way the human vision works, you wouldn't be able to see them. This is what guru makers do. They're often overlooked. They're the person on the forum who's connecting people like, oh, this person's amazing at that particular field. This is, this is the really good security question. What we often underlook is that person may not be technical. That might be a liberal arts person. I actually believe we need a lot more liberal arts in technology. This is somebody who understands group psychology, can communicate, can kind of tone things down. But most importantly, somebody needs to create identity for community members. The guru maker does that. Another important one is um, provocateur. Uh, provocateurs sit within existing successful communities 
and poke them. They're like, yeah, yeah, that's also great, but you know, but we still suck at this. Why, why aren't we focusing on this? Somebody who's kind of agitating and keeping the, the community healthy. Um, I might pick one more. I might just move on. Troll Hunter. Boy, wouldn't Twitter be worth about 10 times more if they had figured out how to have troll hunters in the platform? <laughs> right? It's not good. So you have to have part of the community that acts as police, right? We want to have an open public park, right? Not high walls around it, but one of the reasons we can have nice things in public parks is because we have police. People kind of enforce certain standards of behavior. They don't have to pull a gun. They could just have a private conversation and change somebody's behavior. And they might need to kick people out, right? We know that there's all sorts of abuse that happens on forums. Particularly in developer communities, you have to be aware of abuse of women and minorities. So troll hunters are absolutely crucial because we need diverse ecosystems because the world is diverse. Our businesses are far better if they're represented and built by diverse people. So this is a huge issue that obviously many of us are dealing with in Silicon Valley. If I were to answer the question of what would you do from scratch, right, you'd enforce and make sure that your platform had, had mechanisms to be able to sense trollish behavior and to enable and empower troll hunters. So I'll just close with a thought that perhaps community management is product management for an ecosystem. And for all of you who didn't raise your hand when you said, when we said, do you have any people doing developer relations and didn't raise your hand when we asked you if you had anybody doing community management, I would take a hard look at your current staffing plan. I'd freak out and I'd figure out how to hire at least one because somebody that you're employing is one-tenth as productive as this one first community manager you're going to hire. So I suggest that you get after that. Um, so to close, don't process this as a single wave, right? I almost drowned in the Pacific the first time that I got into it. I was about 17. And I was looking away from the water. And there was a wave. No big deal. There's a second wave. Oh dear, I wasn't anticipating that. I lost my balance. I was in the wrong part of the beach. There's an undertow. If I just turned around and looked at the nine waves coming, I might have responded differently. So what I'm hoping to do is leave you from the idea that this is something you have to deal with for a year or two. This is the long-term durable state. The change is going to increase, but we have a sense of what the future looks like, right? And it looks like this. So let's make sure that we're building the next generation of developers. Let's make sure that we're building the kind of diverse and inclusive technology community that reflects the diverse world that we're trying to play in.